be with us today, watching us on the internet, Lord, that you would touch them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So in verse 7, it says, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And so now we come back once again to one, one of John's main topics, that is of love. And so the question I have today for you is, how does the world see the love of God if it hates God? It's an interesting question, isn't it? How does the world, because we already know that the world hates God, right? We, John's already told us that. We know that from John's uh, gospel as well, that the world, that men love darkness rather than light. So the question still stands. How does the world see the love of God if it hates God? Well, it's in our scripture today, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out. You see, God's love is demonstrated in the world by how we love one another and how we love those in the world. Um, is that a little bit of pressure on you today? I want you to think about this and kind of wrap your head around it. The only way the world really knows the love of God is by the ambassadors that he has in the world. And who are his ambassadors? That's us. Isn't that kind of frightening? <laughs> that uh, we're it? We're the ones showing this love to the world? So what does that tell us a lot? That if somebody is... Uh, does not know the love of God, it's perhaps someone around them is not showing that love to them. Now, as we go through for the last couple of weeks, we've seen that uh, the world defines love differently on how the Bible defines love and how we define love. And so that's what's different. The world is looking at love in a different way than when, what we are doing. So let's, let's break this down. Beloved, we... Uh, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who is born of God knows God. So, we are not commanded to love one another or to earn or become worthy of God's love because we love one another. We love one another because we are loved by God and have received that love in the light of it. And this is what's interesting. As we go through this whole chapter, you are incapable of loving the way that God loves us without Him. Everybody got that? There, there are people in this world that are not saved that have love, but they do not have God's love. And it's not the love that they might have storge love, family love. They might have phileo love, which is brotherly love or eros love towards a spouse, but they do not have agape love. And you only can have that love, well, first knowing that God loves us. So, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God, and everyone who is born of God knows God. So John's emphasis on love among the people of God is shown not only in 1 John 2, 9, and 3, 10. It's powerful in those sections, but here he also shows us why it's important. So if we love God, then those who claim to be born of God, if that's what you're claiming today, that you're born of God, and you claim to know God, then there will be something coming out of you, which is loving one another. John insists that there is something that is given to the believer when they're born of God. Just like when you and I are born, your parents gave you something. Well, maybe a lot of something. Maybe they gave you your hairline. I'm looking around the room. Or no hairline. Uh, or your propensity or for music or creative arts or something, or they gave you a, 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 you know, a certain feature on your face that distinguishes you. But there is something that when you were born, you're, that's just given to you. It's no different. When we're born of God, God gives us something. Everybody know what it is already? It's love. It's supernatural love that only comes from Him. So if we claim to be born of God and know God, then we will then love one another. Christians are not just forgiven, they are born anew by God's Spirit. So, when he says here, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, that word know is our favorite word, gnosko, to know by experience. And so, John is saying when we really experience God, it shows by our love for one another. And as we'll see today, there is so much here today. Tim, I, I hope we can work through it today. <laughs> uh, there's so much to get through, but the idea 
for us is that if we are born of God and we know God, then it's going to be manifest in our life. It's going to be demonstrated. And just as we've been teaching on on Wednesday night and uh, Jesus going to the fig tree, and when the, the, the leaves are on the fig tree, Jesus expected there would be figs there. And he says that to the believer. If you're born of God and you know, then I expect that there would be some fruit, and that fruit for us is loving one another. Verse 8. He who does not, um, he who does not love, does not know God or know by experience. Right, same, that same word gnosko, for God is love. This is a glorious truth. Why? Because love describes the character and the heart of God. He is so rich in love and compassion that, well, this is described as his very nature. Now. Again, agape, for those who haven't been with us, it is that self-giving love that gives without demanding or expecting repayment. Now, what I find is interesting is because God is love, did you see that in that verse? God is love. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that he hates nothing that he has made. You see, he cannot hate because he is love by definition. Because he is love, he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. He has made no human being for perdition or hell, nor ever rendered it impossible. Now, there are those in Christendom that say, no, God created some just for hellfire. That is a a poor translation and a poor doctrine. Because if God is love, he cannot hate. Isn't that interesting? Now, you might think, yeah, but pastor, I've read somewhere in the Bible where it says that God hated Esau, but that word hate means to love less. It doesn't mean that he actually hated Esau. I can't believe that he loved Jacob, amen? Heel planter, surplanter. We won't get into that study. That's a while, isn't it? Now, there are great problems, David Gusick says, when we try to say love is God. This is because love does not define everything in the character of God. And because when most people use the term love, they're not talking about the true love, the God kind of love. Instead, they're thinking of a squishy, namby-pamby, have a nice day kind of love and values, more than wanting what is really best for another person. Again, that's, that's the problem. The world is defining love in its way, not in the way of the Lord. Now, the Bible also tells us that God is spirit from John 4, God is light from 1 John 5, and that God is a consuming fire. And as we'll see today, God is also a God of truth. So, there are those who would just want to proclaim that God is love. In fact, we will see people who are not believers have banners that say God is love and then have a peace fest, right? (laughs) And they'll smoke dope and they'll have immoral relations with one another, and they'll just say, but God is love, man. Yes, that's true, and that's here, but that's not all God's character. God is a consuming fire. I love that for a title of God. He is a consuming fire, and as we'll see at the end today, he is a God of truth, which means, yes, here is the God of love, but he also has judgment awaiting those who have not accepted that. There are a few people who really know, and really believe that God is love. For whatever reason, they won't receive his love and let it transform their lives, so then they must see it in us. And that's how we started today, isn't it? For whatever reason, you tell them God is love, and they won't hear it because of maybe their experiences growing up in some form of religion, or someone demonstrated something against them that I'm just thinking about people who have been raised in a religious system and they heard that God was love, but they never saw it demonstrated, right? And so that person, that's what they equate with, God is love. And so in order for that person to really understand that God is love, they must see it out of you and I. Is that the hardest thing that you've heard yet? (laughs) That they will see it only out of the church. Can I tell you that Muslims are getting saved in the Middle East because they are seeing the love of those who are being martyred for their faith. 
And when a Christian is being put to death, he will typically say to his uh, a persecutor or executioner, I forgive you and God loves you. Do you know what the impact of that is? Can I tell you what the impact of that is? That's Stephen, while Paul is standing with the coats, coats holding the coats while they're stoning Stephen. That image of St- Stephen and his sermon never left Paul's mind. I would say that it haunted Paul until his conversion on the road to Damascus. And even then, Paul took that with him for the rest of his life because he saw love demonstrated in Stephen. So too, you and I. In order for this world to see God's love, it must see it from us. Well, let's continue. Verse 9, or we won't get very far. In this... The love of God is manifested or revealed towards us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. This shows us what love is and what it means. You see, love is not defined by the sacrifice of Jesus, although it is stated in 1 John 3.16. It is also defined by the giving of the Father. It was the sacrifice for the Father to send the second person of the Trinity. Jesus was our sacrifice, and God poured upon all of the sins of mankind upon him. So when it says, in this the love of God was revealed towards us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. We'll get to that live part in a minute. Now note with me that John carefully calls Jesus the only begotten Son. Reminds us again of John 3.16. This special term means that Jesus has a sonship that is unique. He says only, and it's begotten, which means it indicates that Jesus and the Father are of the the same substance, the same essential being. Now, we use the word create to describe something that may come from someone, but it isn't of the same essential material or nature or being. You see, a man can create a statue that will look like him, but it will never be human, will it not? However, we use the term begot to describe something that is exactly the same as us in nature and human. We are adopted sons and daughters of God, but we are not the same essential nature as God. You see, we are human beings, and God, well, he is a God being. Now, because Jesus is the only begotten son, meaning his sonship is different than ours, he was and is of the same essential nature, and being as God the Father, again, we are human beings, but he is a God being who added humanity to his deity. Who's uh, having smoke come out their ears right now? I don't get it either. It's hard to understand. How can you have 100% of God and 100% of man? But that's the mystery that Paul says. Well, verse 10. Now, in this, in this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the payment for our sins. So real love, agape love, is not defined by our love for God, but His love for us. His love for us initiates our relationship of love with Him. Our love only responds to His love for us. You see, we can't love God the way that we should unless we receive His love in our life first. It is impossible for you to love God in the way that God wants to be loved unless you first have that love. And what is that love? We just saw it in the verse before, that he gave his only begotten son. So we see, the church sees this, that the love of God is demonstrated upon the cross. That is love. Would you note with me? In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. Now, did he know who you were before he sent his son? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and isn't that the good news? Is that he knew who we were before he even sent his son. Notice, beloved, 
if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So having received this love from God, we are directed to love one another. The pattern of receiving from God and then giving to others was familiar to John. Well, in fact, he wrote about it in John chapter 13. When Jesus washed the feet of the disciples and showed such great love and servanthood to them, we might have expected him to conclude that session by gesturing to his own feet and say, okay, boys, it's your turn. But he didn't do that. He said, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, John 13, 14. You see, the proper way to love God in response to his love for us is to show that love to who? Others. God is well pleased with us when we are loving one another, when we are doing what he has commanded us to do. So, if we do not love one another, how can we say that we have received the love of God and have been born again? Love is the proof, and we are taught to look for it. If you had a pipe that was clogged and water was just going into it but never coming out to it, uh, going out, you would say that that was useless. You would either replace it or clean it out. So God puts his love into our life that we might flow out. We want the Lord to clear us and fill us so that his love can flow through us and out of us to your next door neighbor, to the coworker, to your boss. Yes, I said it. Love your boss. Oh, it's hard, isn't it? I hear the pain, brother. I feel it. Wait a minute. I'm my boss. Whoa. So when we feel the love of God, when we see the love of God demonstrated in our lives, God expects us to let that love pour out of us. And again, from the beginning of the message, that is how the world is going to see the love of God. They're going to look at you, and they're not going to be able to figure you out. Why are you so happy at work? Why are you so happy doing these things? That You've got the worst job than anyone else, and you're so happy to do it. Why? And what can you explain to them? Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for me. He died for you. And it's showing that love. Well, verse 12, and then he just throws this in here. I, I love how John is. He's like somebody that's writing an email. You ever wrote an email? No, none of you. You've wrote, you're writing an email, and then you think of something, and you throw it in there, but it, mean, it makes no sense to anybody but you. Well, that's what John does. He says, no one has seen God at any time. Now, when he's speaking of God here, is he speaking of Jesus? No, he's speaking of the Father, and that's important. So we might say, no one has seen the Father at any time. And then he says, if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in it. So it would have been good if the translators would have just stopped at that period and made the next verse. Wouldn't that have been nice? Well, that's not what they did. No one has seen God at any time. In speaking of God the Father, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1.17, now the king eternal, immortal, invisible. Jesus declared of God the Father that God is spirit from John 4, meaning that God the Father has no tangible body which to be seen. And we know this from the experience of Moses, right? Moses said, listen, Lord, I just want to see you. And he says, listen, Mo, if you see me, you will melt. He says, but I'll tell you what, I'll put you in the cleft of a rock. And as, as I go by, you'll see my contrail. That's what it means. You'll just see the vapor as I go by. What happened to Moses when he just saw the vapor of God? His whole head went white, right? And it was so bright, his countenance, when he got off the mountain, they had to cover him because he was so bright. By the way, that's how we should be as believers, that we're so bright that people just, well, they run from us, right? I mean, think about it. Men are in darkness, and they love the darkness, and then you walk in the room, and you're like a 1,000-watt bulb in their life, and they can't stand it. 
Remember what I shared last week. We need to be a people of joy. I'm glad that uh, Foy said that this morning. We are the most happy and joyful people on planet Earth. There is no reason, as we'll see even today, to fear. Where are we? Um, uh, uh, 12, we're still in 12. He says, if we love one another, God abides in us. So this is the greatest evidence of God's presence and work in us, which is love. Since no one has seen God at any time, this provides evidence of the presence of God, right? Because no one has seen him, they need to know what that love is. And again, that love is demonstrated in the life of his children, in the life of the church. Now, some people think the greatest evidence of God's presence or work is power. Some people think the greatest evidence of God's presence or work is popularity. Some people think the greatest evidence of God's work is passionate feelings. But the greatest evidence of God's presence and work is love. Where God is present and working, there will be what? There will be love. Let me say that again. Where God is present and working, there will be love. Now, sometimes Jesus seemed weak and lacking in power, but he always was filled with love. Sometimes Jesus wasn't popular at all, but he was always full of love. Sometimes Jesus didn't inspire passionate feelings in people, but he was all, always filled with love. You see, love was the constant greatest evidence of the presence and the work of God in Jesus Christ. And, and I submit to you, one of the things that attracted people to Jesus was love. Because Judaism, at the time of Christ, was kind of devoid of love. Do you see that? Do you see that from the religious leaders and the harshness that came from them all the time? And there wasn't a a message of love. Again, that's why I believe that so many Muslims come to Christ because the love that they see. Why? Because there is no love in Islam. Why do Hindus come to Christ? Because they see love. And that's devoid of that religion. Love is so powerful. His love has been perfected in us. Now, that word perfected doesn't mean perfect. It means mature or complete. So if we love one another, then the love of God is made complete in us. You see, the mature Christian will be marked by love. Again, the true measure of maturity is not the image of power or popularity or passionate feelings, but the abiding presence of God's love in our lives given to others. Listen, remember our illustration of the sink and the clogged pipe? I mean, we can get love all day long, but unless that flows out, it starts to be dead. There's a lake in uh, Northern California that was just in the next county from us. It was called uh, Clear Lake. It was a huge lake, great lake. The problem is, in the summertime, not enough water is coming into the lake, and that's flowing out. So in the summertime, it becomes a lack of oxygen, and the fish start dying in the lake. The lake becomes useless to those living in the lake because there is not an inflow, and there must be a what? Outflow. You can't just take in if you're not coming out. In fact, the greatest example of that is the Dead Sea, is it not? Water comes in, doesn't go out, it's a complete Dead Sea, and you can float in it, which is kind of cool. So the Christian is marked by the the presence of God's love in our lives given to others. Verse 13, now by this we know, we learned this last week, we learned a lot about being confident in our relationship with God and our eternal salvation. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit, or we might say his Holy Spirit. So beginning with the words by this, John connects the thoughts of the previous verse. For we can know by experience that we live in God if we have been made perfected or matured And we know that his love has been made mature in us because we love one another. So, are you ready for this? Not just the assurance of the Spirit in our life, but you can know that you're saved because you love one another. Have you ever heard that before? 
That is one of the proofs in your life. I know that I'm going to heaven. Why? Well, we'll see in a minute. I've got the Holy Spirit inside of me as a guarantee. But I also, because I am loving one another. How many of you have been at that place where you want to, well, let, let me put it this way. You didn't want to love that person. But you realize that um, I have to love them, right? And that love. And when we're talking about I have to love them, it just you don't just go up to that person and say, you know what? I have to love you. Does that sound like love to anyone? <laughs> Do that next time, uh, husbands, to your wife. I have to love you because God said so. Ladies, would you be enraptured by that? <laughs> oh, honey, the words that you speak to me. That would have, you wouldn't like that, right? So when we, when we say that to another human being, I have to love you because God said so, they don't feel that. So you have to change your heart, and only God can change your heart. And how does God change it? Well, he tells us right here, it's by his spirit. He says, by this we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. So Christians, we can know we don't have to merely hope we are saved or hope we will make it to heaven, thus having no assurance of salvation before we pass from this world to the next. We can know, and we can know today on this side of eternity that we will be with him. For God has given his spirit to us. Again, John brings up the work of the spirit in us for two reasons. Number one, first, it is the spirit of God that is abiding, uh, and his presence in us is that of Christ. And that presence of the Holy Spirit is how he abides in us. And secondly, it is the testimony of uh, the testimony of the Holy Spirit within us that makes us possible for us to know that we abide in him. In fact, Romans 8, 16 says it this way, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You see, the Holy Spirit gives us that assurance and the fact that you are loving one another gives us the assurance. I don't know about you, listen, there's not a whole lot in this world to be assured of, right? Right? I mean, at one point in this nation, you could be assured that your government was going to look after you. Or your insurance company. Or who else? I have none of that insurance today. The only assurance I have is that, A, (laughs) Christ died for me, and I accepted that into my life, and because His Holy Spirit is in me, I will be with Him in heaven. That's the assurance. I, I can't offer you any other assurance than that. I can't offer you assurance that come November, this nation will change. I can't give you that. By the way, um, Russia uh, is on the move. They're moving towards Armenia for some reason. I haven't figured that one out. But they're massing troops near Armenia. Remember, we just had this issue last year with Crimea and Georgia. The bear is moving, and the bear is in prophecy. I give you no assurance other than, well, right here, he says that by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirits. Now, when I just said the bear is moving, you're not to be afraid because we'll learn that in a minute. The fear of God's judgment and what's coming, you know, we get excited. When I say the bear is moving, can I get a woohoo? Thank you. It just fulfills prophecy. And then people are like, those Christians are weird. Yes. I fully admit that we're weird. But you know what? Jesus, he was, a, he was a radical too, and they didn't like him. Let's continue. Verse 13. No, we already did that. 14. And we have been seen, or, I'm sorry, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior to the world. Now, when he says we, John is talking about the disciples. So those who were around, they saw, they testified him, they touched him, we beheld him, he says. For whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in us. So there are things that we must do in this world as a believer, and one of them is confess God. That's what he says. It isn't enough to know the facts about Jesus. We must confess the truth. Remember when I said that God was not just a God of love, he was a God of truth? The idea behind the word confess is to be in agreement with 
We must agree with God about who Jesus is, and we find out what God says about Jesus through his word. You may know something about being in agreement with God, but God demands a true agreement. And the word confess, so it also means agreement, but I just want to use our English word for confess, which means we, we need to confess. Do you not believe me? Keep your place here. Let's turn to Romans chapter 9. Sorry, 10. Some of you were like, yes, we know where you're going, but you're off a chapter. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. That's where I was thought of, thrown off. He says that if you do what? Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be what? Isn't that great? That is emphatic in the Greek. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness, and here's the next part, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Got that? There must be, turn back now to 1 John, there must be a confession. And what John tells us here is that what is our confession? Our confession is whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. He is Messiah. He is the second part of the Trinity. He is divine. Got that? There are those who do not claim that he is divine. He's a good teacher. He's a moral compass. Is he God? No, he's not God. See, then we have a problem. We must confess that he is God. Verse 16, and we have uh, known and believed the love that God has for us. For God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. For love has been perfected among us in this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. The day of judgment. This is when the completeness of God's work in us will be demonstrated. As much as we can know the completeness of God's love now, we will know it all the more in the day of judgment. Let me, let me play this out a little bit more. You may know that you're a sinner now, but you're going to know the reality of that on the day of judgment. You may, know that, uh, you may know the reality of hell, but you will really know it on the day of judgment. You may know the greatness of Jesus' salvation now, but you will really know it on the day of judgment. Why? Because you'll see it. It'll be real to you. Now, you and I, on the day of judgment, are not being judged for our sin. That's a great white throne judgment. Those who have not accepted God, where have we been judged? Upon the cross, right? So all of our sins are paid for, and, and, and Christ tells the Father, Lord, I have paid for their sin. And so we are not, well, notice that we have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so we are in this world. Now, verse 18 tells us, for there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now, the completeness of love means that we do not cover in fear or we do not cow. I'm sorry. We do not cower in fear before God, dredging uh, his not dredging, dreading his judgment, either now or the day of judgment. So it's not for us to fear the judgment that's coming. Why? Because we're clear. Um, how many of you have got a speeding ticket? No, raise your hands because there'd be a lot. I saw two hands in the back. Wow. I mean, he put both hands up. <laughs> so, you're always dreading going to court, right? You, you got to take off work. You got to get your lawyer or whatever. You got to go down there. And they just make you feel like you're five years old, right? Like you took a pencil from the Walmart. And you, what would happen, though, if the day before you got a notice from the court said, you don't have to come in. It's, it's all clear. woo Right? I don't have a fear of the judgment. That's exactly what we have. We don't have to fear the judgment that is coming. Because we have come to know the love of God 
We have no fear of perishing by God's hand. I'm assured of the Lord's love, first of all, because he sent his son to die for me. Secondly, I know that he loves me because he indwells me at the present moment. And thirdly, I can look forward to the future with confidence without fear. Again, but he who fears has, been not made, has not been made perfect in love. If our relationship with God is marked by this tormenting fear, it shows us that we, have been not, that we have not been made perfect. That is complete and mature in his love. You see, a Christian who loves has nothing to fear and thus escapes the inner torment which a failure, well, a failure to love brings. You know, guys, the world knows torment too. They know fear, but they don't know where to get it. In fact, let, let me quote to you the great universal poet Yoda. Fear is the path of the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. There you go. That was my Yoda. Listen, if that comes from the world, and the world knows what fear does, imagine what the life of a believer is who doesn't have to go down the path of torment. I think that word is powerful, don't you? Torment? God says, there is no reason that fear should torment anybody. That is very powerful. Now, we had this same idea last week about fear. And I want to make a statement because oftentimes you might think that, okay, we're not to fear anything. And, and that's true. We really are. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned about certain areas around us. But that doesn't mean that we allow that to grip us and to, as he says here, don't you love that word torment? We all know what torment means. That means there are people on planet Earth that are tormented by fear. And what God says, no, no, no. When you've experienced the love of God in your life, that fear does what, guys? It goes right out the door. What does that lead me to believe? Some people maybe in this room have not experienced God's love to the fullest that that fear can be removed. Again, I'm not talking about certain areas that might be a concern in your life. I'm talking about total lap. You can't do anything because you are tormented by this fear of whatever. God says that should never be. And you know what? It's a terrible witness, is it not? It's a terrible witness as a believer. If you're talking to someone, oh, I can't do that. Why? I'm just afraid or I'm afraid of this group or that group. What has this whole chapter been telling us? God's love, well, it gets rid of all of that. In fact, let's read it. You should have it underlined in your Bible, verse 18. But perfect love casts out fear. In my mind, it kicks him out the door. Like one of the angels is a bouncer and he takes fear and he throws him right out the door, right? He casts him out. It's like Jesus casting the demon out of the man in the Gadarene side. Cast him out. And when the man, well, well, what do we read about the man? That he was sitting clothed in his right mind. Listen, if you are tormented by fear today, can I tell you that you can be sitting clothed in your right mind if you would experience the love of God and what he has for you? Let's finish up. But he who fears has not been made perfect, or mature in love. But we love him, why? Because he first loved us. The only reason we love at all is because he first loved us. The Ten Commandments required that a man should love his God and neighbor, but the law could not produce love. How then could God obtain love with which his righteousness required. Well, he solved that problem by sending his son to die for us. Such a wonderful love draws out our hearts towards him in return. We say, you have bled and you've died for us, but from now on, I will live for you. That is our heart. This verse tells us that where our love for Jesus comes from, notice it comes from him. Our love for God is always in response to his love for us. He initiates, we respond. We never have to draw 
God to us. Instead, he draws us to himself. Isn't that nice? We don't have to say, hey, God, do you, you, you want to play today? You want, you want to come by? No, he is always willing. It is us who oftentimes fail. Verse 20, and again, there's these powerful statements. If someone says, I love God and what? Now, we already learned that God does not hate, so that's not in his nature to hate. But it is in our nature to hate, is it not? That is in the human nature, the fallen human state. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is what? Pants on fire. He is a liar. I want to know who who came up with that. (laughs) Now, what rhymes with liar? Fire. Well, what about your pants? And why are they hanging from a telephone wire? These are the things I think about. Sorry. He says, I love God, but hates his brother. He is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Isn't that powerful? If someone says, I love God, it is easier for someone to proclaim his love for God because that regard, or we regard it as a private relationship with an individual, an invisible God. But John rightly insists that our claim of loving God is false if we do not love our brethren, and that love must be seen. It must be demonstrated. Again, in the Bible, love is action. You can see it operating. It it is not just me telling you I love you. It's me demonstrating that love, and that's where the world fails. One may know the word, may never miss a service, may pray fervently, may demonstrate gifts of the Spirit, yet in all that, that one would be like Cain, offering to God the fruits of his hand and not the fruit of the Spirit. Remember, that was our study last time, not to be like Cain, who offered the fruit of his hands, but to be like Abel. Lastly, and this commandment that we have from him, it's the same that we've heard over and over, is it not? That he who loves God, circle this word, must love his brother also. There's not too many commandments in in, uh, the New Testament for us as the body of Christ. We have very few, do we not? In fact, Jesus says we have two. And in them, all the law and the prophets are fulfilled. We have two commandments, to love God and to love... And it is a command. It's not a suggestion. This isn't, well, I don't feel like it today. What if God said, I don't feel like loving you today? Anyone? That would stink. But why do we feel like we can do that to other people? I don't feel like. There's a lot of things I don't feel like doing, but I do them. Because we love somebody else. Well, read ahead. Lord willing, we'll get into part of chapter 5 for next Sunday. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your your beautiful word and your love towards us, that you demonstrated this love, this agape love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Lord, you knew us before the foundations of the world, and you still came into the body of a human, fully God and fully man to be the payment for our sin, to reconcile our debt to the Father. And Lord, now, as we have your Spirit inside of us, and Lord, where light is, there cannot be darkness, and fear is darkness, and fear is torment, I pray for those today, Lord, who are tormented or gripped by fear once again. Lord, that they would come to a a closer walk and knowledge of you and allow your love to pour into their life and cast out that fear forever. Lord, thank you that we can be bold in the day of judgment coming to stand in your presence clean, justified, just as we had never sinned. We thank you for the cross and we thank you for the sacrifice, Lord. And Father, we thank you for sending your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let's stand. We'll worship this last song together. The men and women will be